Tech. My name is Jose. I'm working currently at Uno Digital, and today I'll be talking to you about how we manage to deliver over 300 gigabytes of data to the web in real time. I'm a software engineer, mainly focused on computer graphics, and I, as I told you, I'm currently working at Uno Digital. In, at Uno Digital, we build digital solutions for the oil and gas industry. We build the asset management solutions, IoT solutions, human resources, you name it, we do it. So these are some of our clients. Probably you know a few of, a few of those. And today I'll be talking to you about our 3D visualizer. So at Uno Digital, we build a large-scale 3D, 3D visualization tool that we use as a companion to our Uno platform. So you use it to give context to our data and to show real-time information about uh, IoT monitoring and uh, about risk management. So we can use this, uh, this platform to view point cloud and KF data can use it to take measurements, identify equipments, check uh, IoT data, as I told you, use it for GPS tracking. So before I, told, uh, I tell you how we are doing it, let's talk about our development stack. So for the front-end part of things, we are using JavaScript without uh, any framework. We are using 3GS and Poetry to, to draw our stuff into the screen, kind of. We'll talk about it later. We are using C Sharp for our, our API and Golang for our file server. So. Why did we choose to use 3GS? Does anybody here know about 3GS? Uh, a couple of people, okay, that's, that's great. So it is an open source 3D library. Uh, and we had to choose, we knew at the, at the beginning of the project that 3GS will, would not be enough. We, we would need a lot more. So why did we decide to use 3GS? First of all, I have already a good internal knowledge of the library. I've worked on it for uh, some time. But we had to build a, a custom renderer for the library. So we are using Octrees for our visibility testing, and we are using transform feedback to calculate visibility data. For our framework, as I told you, we, we are using a custom solution. We found out during some testing that uh, using uh, absolute position the DOM was really fast. So we could put a lot of uh, DOM elements in the screen and don't lose uh, any performance. Of course, that means that you have to calculate everything by hand in JavaScript. It is a lot harder to do, but it works real fast. It, pay, uh, it pays off. So let's talk about the, the big word here. What is large-scale visualization? Does anybody have ever worked with large-scale visualization? Does anybody know about it? No. So it is, sim it is simply when you have to draw everything in the real-world scale. And that might not sound like a problem, but it is a problem. Because when you think about it, an equipment can have a kilometer in size, or it can have nanometers. So it is not obvious, but uh, there are a couple of problems. First of all, we need to draw a lot of things. When we are trying to draw a full, a full plant, we are drawing over 1,000 equipments at the same time. And not only the equipments, we go to the individual screw of those equipments. And it's really hard. It's a lot of, uh, of instances. Second problem is that numeric precision is a problem. First of all, we, when you think about it, if you have that plant over there and it has three, 350 meters, it's not a problem if it is off by one meter. But when you think about that pipe that's on that plant, if it is off by a meter, that's a problem. So a position that we start in our database is something like this, and all of those digits are important. We cannot lose them. So let's talk about these problems one by one. First of all, we'll talk about the uh, depth buffer. In WebGL, we, in OpenGL and Vulkan and DirectX and everything else, we have a depth buffer that we use to sort all the objects that are being drawn. One common problem is Z-fighting. It's when you have um, two objects really close and you cannot distinguish them in the Z-buffer. So probably you all saw this happening in games or something like that. We have a lot of those uh, at the beginning, sorry. So this is our platform. Ah, sorry, my computer is... Uh, it's broke and yeah, it happened a lot. Because when you think about it, if you have to fit uh, all the distance of the volume that you are drawing into those 16 or 24 bits, it is not enough. You cannot distinguish anything. You cannot distinguish what's behind, what's in front. So how did we solve it? We used the logarithm depth buffer. Instead of calculating the depth of the objects linearly, as it is usually done, we use the logarithmic function. 
what happens is that we can allocate more precisions to the objects that are real close to you. So the objects that are close, the ones that you are actually seeing right now, are properly ordered. And the ones that are far behind, they have less precision. For those, we are uh, ordering them using the CPU before drawing everything. Another thing that we do is uh, our visualization volume is not fixed, it is dynamic, and we have two of those. So we use one for the objects that are close, and another one for the objects that are far away, and we process them differently. Second problem, user interactions. Since, since we have a lot of objects, it is really slow for the user to pick an object from millions of, uh, of them. So we cannot do the traditional way. The traditional way is to just cast array, check every object, and it d doesn't cut, it is too slow. So we have to do it hierarchically. First, we check a bonding box, box of the object. Then we look into details. It is a lot faster, but it is still not enough. So we have also to do some special, in, uh, special indexation. So we are using an octree. Does anybody here have worked with an octree before? Does anybody know about it? Kind of? Okay. So it is a, a tree structure, and each branch has eight leaves. So each one of these leaves store a volume like this. So we start with the first branch, we divide it into eight, we divide it into another eight, each one of these. And what you can do is you can store the, the data based on position. So instead of accessing it by the number in the array, you, you access it from its position. So this is our Octree visualization, this is our platform, this is our debug visualization. As you can see, when, when there are more uh, equipments, the Octree is more dense. We have more branches for, the, for that, that, those, that zone of the Octree. It also allows us to just work with objects that are in view. So we can look at the camera volume and filter only the branches that are contained in that volume. It is a lot faster now we have just to work with the things that are there to draw them and for user interaction as well, because the user cannot see anything that's out of those boundaries. So, but there's a problem. We have to keep it updated al always. So this is our debug tool, as you can see. Every time I move something around, I have to recalculate everything. And it is kind of hard to keep everything synchronized, especially when, they have multi when you have multiple users working on the platform. This is a larger plant. And these trees can have sometimes 20, 30 levels. They are kind of hard to recalculate. We had to do some work to make it fast and to, to figure out which branches we will actually need to update and work only with those, of course. So let's now talk about data sources. Uh, one of our data sources is 3D models from CAD projects. These models usually are big and they are dense. And each one of those equipments contains everything separately. So if you pick an engine, we have the motor, we have the screws, we have everything uh, in different files. And when you are working with large plants, it becomes a lot of data. Each plant can go easily over one, two gigabytes of, uh, of file size. It is a lot. And we have to deliver it through the web. The first time we started uh, importing models, we, are, we were reading them on the server side. So the user imported the files, it uploaded the file to the server, the server processed it, split it into multiple files, and returned to the user. We had a couple of problems. First of all, the user could not work straight away. It had to wait for the, for the file to be processed and to be returned. And the second, second problem is that we were transferring a lot of data, and that was a problem for some users. So, what we then is to process the, the file on the client side. So the user selects the file, the client processes the file, splits the file, compresses the files, and then sends them to the server. What happens now? The user can work right away, because it has the data local. Why not? Second thing that happens, we end up sending less data, because if you have two gigabytes of data, two gigabytes of data you send it to the server, the server returns 200 megabytes, let's say. But if you process it locally, you are only sending the 200 megabytes in the, in the first place. It is a lot faster. But it is still a lot of data. So we have to, to mask this data while loading. So this is just an example. This is off scale totally. But uh, when we enter into the, the platform, we draw everything with boxes. And as we are loading the, the files, we start replacing them with the actual models. For most use cases, the, the user can work right away. It doesn't need to wait for the server to, to deliver all, the, all, all these files. And it works real nicely. You can see that we opened the project, started with boxes, but soon enough, every, everything starts appearing on the screen. 
For compression, I talked about compression. We are using Drag Compression. It is an open source library from Google. One problem that, problem that we have is that uh, Draco was not designed for, uh, for the web, so it is a C++ library. We had to compile it and use it uh, with uh, WebAssembly, but it, it has really great results. In this example, we can go from uh, almost 8 megabytes to 400 kbytes. That's a lot. That's almost uh, like 5% uh, of the size, I believe. It is a lot. Another thing that we do is uh, we uh, process everything in web, in web workers. And don't know if has anybody here worked with web workers before? Yes, no, a couple of people, holy. Um, so what is a web worker? A web worker is a second context of JavaScript that you can exchange me messages with. So it is parallel computing on JavaScript. So let's, uh, let's imagine you have uh, this really big task that if you execute on your main thread, even, if, even doing it uh, asynchronously, it will block your application. Because, because with JavaScript, it is single thread. You can only do a thing at a time. If you need to do that heavy task, but you need to keep the, the main program running, you can use a web worker. And web workers can exchange message with the, the main thread. One problem with that approach is that it, you end up spending a lot of, the, of data because there are two contexts of JavaScript. They don't share the mem their memory. So if you have to send one gigabyte of data, process, and return it, you are effectively occupying two gigabytes of, uh, of memory. So that's a problem. One thing that we found out is that there are typed arrays in JavaScript that you can just not copy the data, but say, hey, this bunch of data, it's now out of the main thread and this bunch of data is now of the worker, and you don't need to copy, it is a lot faster. One problem is that you have to use native types, so float64, float32, something like that. About point clouds. Has anybody worked with point clouds before? Does anybody know about it? Yeah, my boss, it's over there, shit. Uh, so point clouds are just what the name says. It, it, it's just a, point, a bunch of points. Uh, it's a cloud of points. Uh, and we collect those using uh, scanners. So we have some laser scanners that rotate and take a lot of points from the environment. And we have a pretty nice reconstruction of the, the, the environment, as you can see here. Uh, these are really easy to, to obtain because most of the times the, um, the plants don't have CAD data. Nobody models CAD data for all their, their plants. And they are really cheap to obtain. Currently, we are using a scanner from, from Faro. It is a really good scanner, but it produces a lot of data. So for RGB, we have 363 degree picture. That's 165 megapixels. That's a lot. For each pass, we get about 20 gigabytes of data. So for a plant like this, we get 50 to 100 gigabytes of data. It's a lot of data. And we try to deliver it, all of it to the, to the client. Of course, it's not easy. We don't actually deliver it. Talk about it in a, in a bit. Pottery. Pottery, as I told you before, before, and at the beginning, we are using Pottery. Pottery is an open source point cloud visual visualizer. It already has a, a good octree structure inside to index and process all of the da this data. It, uh, we needed to, to adapt it. Pretty much gone at this point. But. So what's, what's the logic behind point clouds? When you think about CAD data, and we think about triangles, that's usually what we use to draw 3D data into the screen. If you have three triangles and you lose one of them, you cannot only draw those two. They, they don't have any meaning. You have to draw them as triangles. But with point cloud, that doesn't happen. You can just draw a couple of them and keep loading more and more and more on, of them, but this is enough for the user to perceive what's in there. And you can just add detail as we go. So what we, what we do, what Pottery does inside, it's, uh, it uh, puts all of that, uh, that point data into an octree structure. And when we load the application, we load the first level that has a couple of points. Then we load the second level, third level. But we only load the nodes that are in the, the visualization volume. So we don't load the whole, the whole point cloud. We just load what the user is seeing. Of course, we have to calculate visibility for this. And we have to figure out actually what the user is seeing. Uh, differently from what we do to the, to the 3D data, we use the GPU to calculate this, this, what is visible and to calculate occlusion. can do a lot faster with point clouds. Another thing that we do to, to mask our data loading is with, we adapt point size based, based on distance. If you have a, a couple of points over there and you draw them really big, it seems to be a lot more dense than it actually is. 
it is a, a lot nicer for the user. Other thing that we brought from, uh, from Potrint, our platform, is the point cloud fit filtering. So instead of just drawing the points randomly, we calculate distance between them and we filter the, the shape of the, of the point. Instead of throwing everything as points, the shape gets uh, recalculated to be, let, let's say if you have a point over here and a point over here and a point over here, these three points will be drawn pretty much as triangles. So since there are nearby points over here, I'll change a couple of points of this circle to be more closer to that point. And that ends up filtering the point cloud and ends up making stuff readable, which is really cool. So at the end, we ended up creating a new project based on Pottery, which is Pottery Core. It has all the core features of Pottery with some changes that we do to make it faster, to make it usable with any 3GS project. It has support for Draco compressed nodes that Pottery doesn't have. It, uh, we also solved a couple of problems with Pottery. So now we have CAD data, we have point cloud data. How do we load it in the application? Because when you think about it, it's a lot of API calls. And this goes on forever and forever and forever and never stops. While you are using the platform, you are loading tons of data. First thing that we do is we try to process everything in asynchronous or parallel, if possible, to avoid blocking the user. Another thing that we do is, uh, while synchronizing data, uh, sometimes, let's say, I load equipment into the platform, I move it, and then I move it again. But if you think about it, we first need to upload that, the date of the equipment before moving it. So we are processing uh, uh, actions that need to be, they have dependencies, to, and we send them all of the t at, at the same time, which is nice because the user can keep just working, but the server has to wait and process all of this data. What, you do, what we do to explain this to the user is we have that loading bar, and the user can keep working and loading data locally. That's no problem, but he will have to wait for that bar to complete and to make sure that everything is synchronized. The benefit of, of this is that the user don't need to wait for the server. The bad thing is that at the end of the day, they have to keep their, their laptop running to send all of the data to the user, which is better than just waiting in the first place. Another thing that we do, we, we looked for some alternatives to JSON because JSON is a textual format and we are mostly sending binary data. We tested a couple of solutions. We ended up using uh, Python, which is protocol JSON. Uh, so those are the test results. With JSON, we obtained for the second case uh, 360 megabytes of data. And with Python, we reduced that to 45 megabytes. It's a lot of, of data. Of course, it takes a bit longer for the browser to process everything, because with Python, we are doing this with JavaScript. And JSON, it's, it's parsed by the browser, which is a lot faster. So we talked about how we are moving this data, how we are avoiding moving so much data. Let's talk about how we are storing it. We have a, a resource server that this is our file server that takes care of storing all this data, indexing all this data, and returning it to the user. We also did a couple of tests because we, we had a lot of requests, and we had to find a good solution to move a lot of data through HTTP. So first, we tested Express, not HTTP, net HTTP with Go and fast HTTP. We figured out that fast HTTP with Go is really fast, really fast. But then we found some limitations with the HTTP 1.x. So uh, since HTTP creates a connection for each request, uh, there is a limit. Browser imposes a limit, Chrome imposes eight, Firefox imposes six, and uh, everything else needs to wait for this to be processed. Another thing that the browser does, it also imposes a limit on the, on the waiting queue. And we found out that uh, each worker has uh, uh, its own waiting queue. So if you use workers, you can do a lot more requests. It was not enough, so eventually we found out about HTTP 2.0. Does anybody know about HTTP 2.0? Yes, is anybody using it? OK, that's, that's nice. You should. Uh, it is a, a new version of HTTP. It is not text anymore. It is binary now, so the name doesn't make sense anymore. And it is mul fully multiplex, so you have a single connection, and you try to send all your requests through that connection. You multiplex them, which is a lot nicer because you don't have requests waiting forever. Uh, it also does some compressor on the header. You cannot send it at all, but it is, uh, it is nice as well. So we did a couple of tests. And we figured out that it was even faster that f than fast HTTP, and that's what we are, we, we are using right now. Other thing that we tried to do that is kind of hard, we have a lot of instances, as I, as I was telling you before. We have 
the user interacting with those, but we, we wanted to have more complex interactions. So we tried to figure out some way to do more in, a more interactive layer with the user. We tried a couple of solutions. We tried to render DOM to the canvas and then send the canvas to the GPU as a texture and render it out. But we also tried to align the DOM with the, the 3D scene, and we can do that because now we have the CSX tra CSS transformations. They are introduced in CSS3. So basically, we, this allows you to apply a 3D transformation to a DOM object. Basically, that means that you, now you can do something like this that you are seeing here on the, on the left. We can uh, just pick up the, the transformation that you calculate for each one of, the, of our objects, and we can just copy it to the DOM object, and we'll, it will behave as it if, we, if it was placed on the 3D world. Of course, everything is run off, on top of the canvas, because most of this is just a, a canvas in the background, and those are the DOM objects in the, in the, um, in the upper layer. As you can see, I'll have to skip this slide. Okay, as you can see here, so if I uh, open the, ins the inspector tool and I start selecting stuff, you can see that those are actually um, DOM objects, which is kind of called the background, is a single canvas, everything is layered on top, and it works, it is cool. Another topic, so we have maps, I already know that. We georeference everything in the platform, so everything has a place to be, and equipment is inside of a plant, and it is really useful to know what that, where that stuff is, uh, is located, especially for people of maintenance, because they, they get to the production plant and nobody knows where anything is. This helps. Uh, we are using a tile-based solution. It is basically a quadri, the same as a knock tree, but in the 2D space. And we had to, to build a, a map layer that subdivides, subdivides based on the, what the user is seeing right now. Same idea as we are doing with the, the Octree. Have a small video of the, the map actually dividing with our wireframe view. People like to see this, I don't know why. Also like, it. it is kind of cool. Anyway, we tried a couple of data sources. Probably everybody here has worked with maps uh, at some time, and everybody asked, what is the best map service? Which one has the best results? So we tried pretty much all of them. Then I open street maps because yeah, we are we don't we don't want to spend money and they are free. We tried Mapbox, here maps, Map Tyler, Bing Maps. We also tried the Google Maps, but yeah, they, they don't allow us to to take everything as tiles as you wanted, so it's not here. Also tried satellite satellite imagery. Ended up selecting Mapbox because the price is reasonable. Uh, they have pretty much everything that we need, and they have a really cool style editor where you can change the, the look and feel of your maps. Totally rec recommend it. But one problem with this approach to draw maps is that the maps are distorted. So if you think about it, you have a sphere and you try to unwrap it, it, it is not a rect uh, rectable. A rectangle, so you have to stitch it, uh, stitch, no, stretch it on the on the corners. So what happens is near the equator everything is measured properly, but near the edges of the map uh, things are bigger than they should be. Russia is not that big, trust me. <laughs> we had to deal with this. We explored a couple of solutions because we still wanted to to keep that tile-based scenario. And we ended up founding these MIRI, I don't know how to pronounce this, projections. They work, they are really cool. Check them out if you need to. It's easy to adapt the, the tile-based solution to work with these. Of course, you have to reprocess everything in the, in the steps. So we, we, had to load, we had to download everything from Mapbox, reprocess it, and then show it to the users. So this is not, not a good solution, but it works. Another thing that we found out is that Mapbox has some uh, height data. So it has elevation data. They have these tiles. They, what they do is they pack the, the, the elevation of the terrain in the RGB, RGB data of the, of the image. And what we can do with this, we can generate 3D scenario with that information, which is really cool. So what we are doing here is we are creating 3D tiles based on that data, which allows us, the user, to have a, a perception of the elevation of the terrain, which is really nice. This is still a bit experimental. We are still doing everything on the client regarding this. We are not processing anything on the, on, on the server. Here's a, a small example. It is still a bit experimental, so there are a couple of things that are not aligning properly. Um, 
I believe these are the Alps. If nobody here has gone to the Alps, those are the Alps. I don't know if they are pretty, I've never been there, but it, it looks to be nice. So the same thing as wireframe, people like to see this, so there you go. It's a couple of wires joined together. You also try to, to write the same algorithm in the GPU. It faced some precision problems, which is a shame because, yeah, those values are really high. They, they don't fit in the, in the 16 bits that we have over here and some, and some GPUs. Because the problem with GPUs is that the, the precision of the number is not fixed. Some GPUs can only do 16, some can only do 24. So when you say high precision, it can be anything. It can be 16, it can be 64. We don't know. Another problem that we had, by the end of the project, we made everything, we tested it, it was working, and then I found out that my boss has had a, a laptop that had no GPU. It, has, it had the, the integrated GPU from Intel. So then we had a new challenge. We had to up optimize everything to run on laptops that don't have a good GPU. Uh, and one problem that we have, it, it is a bit hard on the web to perceive how much performance your client has because you don't have anything that specifically says to you that the GPU is model A or model B or that the user has four or eight gigs of RAM. One thing that, uh, that I did was I started testing with a couple of, uh, of sample programs to see how, how much time it takes to run and then I decided how much GPU power the computer had based on, on that. I do that for point clouds, I only load points until the GPU cannot handle it anymore. And I do the same for the, the rate, the, um, the speed that I'm loading the model. So if the GPU is slow, I don't try to load everything at once. I load at the same pace that the GPU can process data. And it ends up being faster because the, the client doesn't get stalled as much as if I'm trying to load, to load everything at once. Uh, another thing that we do, we implemented a button that is just limit power. So, uh, when the user is still uh, getting stalled in the application, you can click that button and it'll just decrease the, the number calculated by the benchmark. And it, apparently it helps because sometimes my, my boss is trying to view things in 3D and work with uh, the Excel at the same time and it, it cannot because the, the web application is consuming all of its resources. Another thing with uh, this kind of scenario is that this is not your usual web optimization. Usually you have a, a bunch of rules that you can follow that will ensure that your application is fast. Not the case here because if you look at that graph, it's better when you are processing more things. When you have more scripting time, it means that we are processing more data. Of course, we have to be efficient. We have to try to make our algorithms as, as fast as possible. But we also have to try and occupy the most CPU time that we can and try to still reduce painting times and raining times, of course. Um, Another, th another thing that we found out is we, we really have to be careful while loading data with WebGL because it also like blocks the main thread. So we try to pre-process everything up ahead and just block the GPU when we have to. Uh, by the end of the project, we found out that the application does run on mobile platforms. It is was not designed for mobile, but uh, mobile ended up being a, a good scenario for testing our, uh, our GPU support because in mobile phones, WebGL support is totally broken. Uh, most of the features have some sort of problem, you have to, to test everything, and end up solving most of them. And this is where we found out mo we found most of our precision problems, because in mobile GPUs, usually high precision means the same as low precision, and that's a problem. So, how did we fare in the end? This is a product from Hale, uh, Adobe. So this is recap, this is what everybody uses to load point clouds. This is loading from, uh, from local storage, from uh, HDD. And this is our platform, loading from the web. So we load everything instantly. We can see the, the, that, the data right ahead. We can see the data loading as we approach the, um, the, the production plant. And with recap, you have to wait a lot of time. Just to load this scene, you have to wait over five minutes before you can start doing anything. With our platform, of course, we are not loading, actually loading everything, but we, you, you can work right, uh, right ahead. You don't need to, to wait any time. And eventually, you'll get all of the data that you want if you wait enough time. And while the, the Adobe application is loading, we can even switch scenes and see another point clouds, which is kind of great. This is really fast. I'm, we are really proud of this, uh, of this product. So. Lessons learned. 
special indexation can be a lifesaver. Use it if you have to, it is nice. Uh, dynamic DOM updates affect performance a lot, so if you have a real huge DOM reflow, the application will get stuck for a lot of time, avoid those. Sometimes it's better to process data on the client, you, you avoid sending as much data to the server, and that end up saving some money because you are processing stuff on, on your client computer. Uh, web workers should be used, but don't use too many, they consume a lot of resources. And don't offload everything to the, to the GPU, some computers don't have a good one, and that ends up being a problem as well. So don't use all the tricks in the book, just like f full out. Just be careful, use them as you, as you need to. Uh, don't bloat the, your client computer just because yes. So thank you a lot for having me here, for having my talk. <laughs>